Okay. I'm here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Great. I just unmuted them. Hi. Super. Hi, hi. Um, and uh, Professor Sali? Yes, I'm here as well, Anita. Great to see you. Um, so just to do a quick uh, round of introductions, I will keep this uh, brief because I believe everyone in the panel is quite well known. Um, we have um, Professor Razin Sali um, with us today. He is an associate professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And uh, he's also an advisor to the Advocata Institute um, as well as being uh, many other things. Um, we have Dr. Nishan Dimel here with us today. Uh, he is the executive Executive Director of Verite Research and also an advisor to the Advocata Institute. Um, Dr. Sarat Rajapatrana, our third panelist, who will also be giving a quick keynote um, as we start, is the chair of the academic program at the Advocata Institute. Um, thank you all for joining in and for taking time during uh, this rather hot afternoon um, to, to discuss the economic impacts of COVID-19. Um, so the general flow of today's session will be as followed, so follows. Um, Professor uh, Dr. Raj Patirana, forgive me, um, will be speaking for approximately 15 minutes, giving everyone a general overview of the situation. Um, and then we will open up uh, the uh, virtual flow for questions from the audience. Um, please direct your questions to Slido. We have shared the link and we will reshare it on the group chat. Um, it'll be easier for us to keep track of questions on Slido and there is a chance that if you put your questions on the group chat that I might miss it. Um, so to avoid that, please do put your questions on Slido and vote up questions that you would like us to take up uh, during the discussion. Um, thank you. Uh, final reminder to keep mics switched off during the discussion unless you are a panelist and to keep cameras switched off during the discussion unless you are a panelist. Thank you very much. Um, Professor, uh, sorry, I really apologize, Dr. Raj Patrina, if uh, uh, the, we, we hand the virtual floor over to you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Anita. So what I'll do this afternoon is to pro uh, Propose to do a general introduction, as you mentioned, and touch the key areas, implications, what happens. Then, as you, as you mentioned, of course, uh, Nishan and uh, Razin will join in uh, with the uh, in detail, going deeper into this than I would do in this, uh, uh, out, in, in a way, an outline presentation. I remember we get only into the economic aspects of it. There are so many other aspects uh, that we will not get into where we are competent to do it, because there are medical and uh, other technical areas. So I will start with what are the initial conditions when this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, struck us. Uh, and we were actually in a very... Uh, relatively weak economic situation. For example, our growth rate has fallen 2.6. Uh, that is the number that we have for the first half of 29, that's the latest we have, compared to our uh, st uh, growth rates in the last three decades of close to past 4%, 4.3%, I believe. Then earnings from, and earnings from tourism had fallen, particularly after the particularly after the Easter Sunday bombings, uh, April 21st. And the immediate future for tourism did not look good. And it is uh, also not therefore expected to look uh, good at all, particularly because of the fear of this uh, country, Sunday, Sunday thing. Our exports have not risen in order to uh, help the current account. So we have a wider current account deficit with its implications. Uh, we have about 7 billion uh, in our reserves. Uh, actually, this was at the end of December. We had 7.6, but I think due to some outflows, I don't have the exact number. I think 7 billion is not a bad estimate. Finally, we had to meet uh, large debt payments. We have outstanding debt, uh, about 55 to 56 billion. Uh, and we had to pay something around $16 billion in the four years, that is between 220 and 2030. So those are our initial conditions. Now, when we look at the economic impact uh, of uh, COVID-19, 
we can talk about a direct effect and an indirect effect. I'm now generalizing in a very broad way. One is that they obviously people are not going to work. I mean, everybody is in quarantine except some except uh, some part of the island today. And also the quarantine seems to be quite uh, uh, strong in the most popular areas of Colombo, uh, uh, Kalutara, and Gampa. So really then there is a reduction in our output associated with people simply uh, self-quarantine. And uh, so that is, that is uh, that we have to see the other implications for wages and things like that. I'll come to that in a minute. And uh, so we can expect a, a decline in uh, national income, fall, fall in wages, Wage bills, profits, and interest incomes will remain low. Uh, the last time we had a, such a situation of actually decline in GDP was in 2001, that due to much milder situation with, uh, I think, I believe it was a drought rather than bad economic policy at that time. Uh, while we deal with the emergency, I think the point I will emphasize, this will come up later when I sum up. While we have to deal with this, and we have done uh, well uh, about the emergency program that is put into effect, the, the isolation uh, of, uh, if you like, uh, of people from each other so as not to carry the virus uh, from one person to another, we have done that well in the short run. I think that our sort of uh, uh, mortality rates so far speaks well to our ability to have uh, controlled it and done it. Now, uh, but beyond that, when you look at the, I'm worried about the day after or the years after. So what we adapt, what type of uh, instruments we adapt during this time, we see it's essential, some things are essential to be done. Uh, what happens in the few years afterwards? Uh, so in other words, Economics come into play. Here is the medical uh, uh, preventive aspects uh, that dominate, but we cannot avoid having to face uh, the economic situation uh, post uh, this infectious period. And so I, I don't know whether uh, I, I see somebody's, uh, am I still alive here? Hello? I see something. I, uh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, okay, but, fine. Now yeah. somebody came in and went out there. So uh, then the government proposed, uh, uh, proposed a number of things. Uh, I'll give you one or two or three examples. Uh, uh, grace periods for payment of income tax and VAT for particular some purpose like green wall or driving licenses. Uh, then uh, delay again uh, play, paying up uh, uh, Trade cards, uh, uh, card bills are less than fifty thousand. Uh, three wheelers, uh, they their lease uh, payments they can hold up till end of May. Twenty thousand allowances to graduates chosen who are training, uh, doubling of in, uh, insurance for health workers, and then uh, joint. Uh, uh, Bank of Ceylon, People's Bank, National Savings Bank, EPF. Employees trust fund are to jointly invest in treasury. Be that means lend money to the government. Uh, most of them are actually based on directions, orders, and quantitative measures. Prices in this system seem to me, at least my reading of the situation, rather fixed and not made use of. The mechanism is not made use of. Uh, later, I'll come back to that again. Uh, now, the, our concern on the distribution side is that most of the things that we are doing, uh, uh, this government is doing, it directed as people who are some of the uh, recipients. Basically, uh, people who are not really in a, uh, what they call in America, dirt poor, poor nevertheless, but there are many people who are on some of the recipients who receive money, although they have uh, high, higher income than the, uh, the the official poverty level. And so the, the real challenge would be how to direct these 
uh, if you like, uh, payments to the poor in the sense to call unemployed, self-employed, small SME people. That's the challenge. Now, recently, there's an idea to issue uh, ration books to uh, ration book to the, the people who are not really covered by with the uh, uh, Samurdi case. I, I will say uh, Samurdi has some to be looked at after this thing is over by targeting it. You know, I mean, I just give you two numbers. Probably they are not very good to be um, uh, put together, but our poverty rate as measured by the official poverty level is 4.1%. Some people argue against that, but I know that the methodology used is consistent. Uh, and But our, uh, some of the recipients are close to 50% of the population. So, so, so there, is a, there is a huge case of targeting there. And so how, how more minutes do, how many more minutes I have, Anita? Another five minutes, six yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah five, right. six minutes. So, so let, let me conclude now. Uh, I think the measures proposed by the Pahedan are appropriate at the, the short run situation created by COVID-19, especially on the consumption side. I think that also the uh, isolation uh, of uh, uh, people who are doing voluntary isolation and enforced by using uh, uh, army and the police have worked. Uh, the, the infection rate is low by standards. Of course, many may not have been um, tested. But on the whole, our short term game has been good. I, I think that that's uh, pretty obvious. Now, now I come to the situation where we think about the long term. I see there's a tendency or there's the danger that government has, will overplay this situation, meaning not using prices, not using price mechanism, but do through, go through direction, uh, quantity restrictions, and, and the like. And uh, and so while they are overplaying some hands, some, some point, they're underplaying in the sense that the, uh, the measures to help the poor uh, have to be finally uh, uh, administered, uh, implemented rather by a public service, which is not well known for its speed or efficiency. So we have to see how, we, how that can be done. Now I come to the import restrictions. CBA, uh, Central Bank of Sri Lanka has used few things to uh, if some items are uh, Import is uh, be subject to import restrictions, and I think that is not a very a good way of doing it because it increases the danger of inflation on the one hand, and second, it distorts the the allocation resources, and finally, that would lead to a sort of non-competitive economy. As everybody knows, one of the uh, marks in our growth growth story is that we have had long periods of low total factor productivity. So in actual empirical work in other countries show that if you want to sustain growth, you better have uh, a, a good high total factor productivity relative to other countries. Ours is something very 1.4%. It should be in the neighbor of 25 to 3%. There were some times uh, after the liberalization in 1970s, they were jumping it, uh, particularly for manufacturing, but then it went, went uh, went down. So, to final summary, the uh, short term record is good, but we are concerned about the long run, long term, for these reasons. Whether the uh, the types of measures you in order to at this time will uh, remain in the system that won't be good for better allocation resources, improving uh, our export uh, uh, performance, and uh, basically allocating resources to optimize uh, our rate of growth in the economy. I uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajapatirana. Um, so now I think we're well on time. We'll be moving to the next section of uh, today's discussion. Um, I will now share, I will bring the Slido screen up. Um, we have shared the link uh, 
to the Slido event and the code uh, to log in is hashtag COVID LK. Uh, all of this is in the chat box as well. Um, so send your questions in here. Um, I think, uh, so looking at the questions that have come in, um, the first one I think is quite timely. Uh, uh, Dr. Dimel, if you could sort of weigh in here. Uh, the government has just banned all non-essential imports. Um, and uh, this, uh, in the face of COVID and in the fact that uh, across the world, countries are going to be facing some form of economic downturn, is this really an advisable step? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, I think. Uh, I presume everyone can hear me. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I think... Um, uh, Dr. Rajpatirana made a point that I both agree with and want to modify a little bit. Uh, I think there is a case for um, putting restrictions on imports uh, because of the enormous pressure that Sri Lanka's balance of payments is going to come into uh, with our inability to export uh, our own production coming down. Uh, and there is the reason now to worry about what we may call as luxury imports, for instance, restricting the imports of motor vehicles, maybe, uh, in which Sri Lanka expends a great deal of foreign currency. Uh, there may be categories of uh, imports that we want to restrict that leak a lot of foreign currency, but uh, don't have a direct impact on necessity the economy. At the same time, uh, I think there is a problem uh, in doing it the other way. Uh, of trying, it's better, I think, to define a non-essential list and a very small, limited non-essential list than try to define an essential list. What is essential? Uh, it, it may be very difficult for uh, people uh, to correctly define an essential list and making mistakes on that can have dire consequences, as the questionnaire says on the supply chain uh, as in terms of both production, but also with people's ability to cope with daily life. Uh, so you realize that we have to keep daily life going. And my advice for the government is to not think of restricting imports to essential items, but selectively targeting uh, a few uh, high, very expensive uh, items that could be considered to be non-urgent uh, even if it's non-essential, and to put restrictions, target those restrictions in that way. Otherwise, there will be a negative reverse consequence on society, as Dr. Rajapatharan and others have anticipated. Sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dimel. Uh, Professor Sali, if I could uh, just bring you in here. Um, to, if you could give everyone a kind of understanding of the global outlook here. Um, there is uh, a lot of speculation happening uh, that the, the economic impact of this could be worse than the global financial crisis we saw in 2008. Um, it's, uh, it may be difficult to sort of give a definite answer on that right now, but uh, what is your general perspective on this? Uh, Professor Sali, you're muted. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, Anita, I think we can almost give a definite answer to your question. Uh, it looks like uh, what we're in the early stages of experiencing will be uh, considerably worse than the global financial crisis of uh, uh, just over a decade ago. Um, let, let, me, let me make a few quick points. Uh, the first is, is, um, is really what we can learn from past pandemics and the uh, economic and wider uh, political and social effects. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, there, there are several major pandemics in history. The, the, the last major one was the Spanish flu a century ago. Uh, in terms of discerning a pattern, uh, I, I think what we can say is that the huge short-term economic costs have been followed by lasting structural changes, uh, lasting for, for decades, even centuries, uh, in societies, uh, in economies, uh, in the global economy, and in international politics. Um, and I suspect we might see something similar from this pandemic. Um, one negative aspect is that 
this pandemic, of course, is spreading much faster uh, because of urbanization, travel and trade. Uh, the good news, of course, is that we start from a much richer base and uh, have much more knowledge to tackle uh, disease than we, we used to have. In terms of economic effects, uh, the, in the data coming through do point to the worst slump since the Second World War. Um, uh, it's estimated Chinese GDP in the first quarter contracted by between 10 and 20%, maybe more than that. And we'll see similar falls in output uh, in the first two quarters uh, in, in, in the West. Uh, the optimistic scenario is that this will bottom out by mid-year and then we'll have a so-called V-shaped recovery. I think that looks very optimistic. Uh, perhaps more realistic is that output will, after a severe contraction, will at least stagnate. Uh, and then in some parts of the world might actually recover slowly, uh, not least given current levels of indebtedness and increasing indebtedness around the world. In that sense, it might look more similar to the Western rebound from the global financial crisis, which was anemic. Uh, that's, that's potentially very bad news. Um, now, of course, what we are also seeing uh, is very differential effects, as we've seen with pandemics historically. It hits the poor hardest generally, uh, and it hits developing countries, poorer countries outside the West hardest of all. Uh, in the short term macroeconomic sense, of course, what, what, what we're seeing is uh, our already high debt burdens around the developing world now becoming unsustainable, given what's happening. Uh, so we're on the cusp of very significant uh, debt defaults, uh, debt relief and debt restructuring, I suspect. Um, now, in terms of the policy response around the world, uh, just a couple of quick points. Um, at least in the short term, the libertarian toolkit has to be put to one side at least. I mean, there's, I think, a pretty clear rationale for, for massive short-term intervention, you know, given this massive unanticipated shock. Um, the key is to keep as much productive capacity intact for to take advantage of the recovery uh, when it happens uh, and for targeting both the most vulnerable people, Sarath stressed that point, uh, and of course targeting uh, the productive capacity of uh, enterprises, private sector enterprises in particular. Uh, so what we've seen in the West so far is uh, a massive stimulus still ongoing, about to become more massive, mainly relying on central bank interventions, uh, but also what looks like quite significant and often poorly targeted fiscal stimulus, um, and, and much more besides. Now, this kind of stimulus developing countries simply cannot afford to do, not least because they, uh, they can't borrow uh, the way developing developed countries can. Um, uh, let me j just make a couple of final comments about what we might see in the short to medium term. Um, and then we can discuss the pros and cons and how they relate to Sri Lanka. Uh, to go back to my first point, past pandemics have shown uh, that once you look beyond the short term economic and other costs, uh, you can look at significant changes uh, that stick. Uh, and the way I read the initial signs of this crisis is that changes that have already been underway in, in the world, in politics and economics, are probably going to be accelerated by this crisis. Uh, so so what, what are these changes? Firstly, uh, a recalibration of the state market relationship. Now we've seen significantly more state intervention around the world domestically and also in cross-border transactions, not least on international trade since the global financial crisis. Uh, I think what we're seeing now is a significant ratcheting up of that. 
Much of that hopefully will be rolled back, particularly from a limited government free market perspective. But looking at it realistically, some of it is going to stick into the medium and long term. Uh, expectations have been created, entitlements are being created. Uh, and it's going to be politically almost impossible to roll all of that back. So I think w w a bigger role for the state and more controlled markets uh, is, uh, is very much on the, on the cards. And that will manifest in various ways. Uh, reliance on central bank interventions, uh, on fiscal stimulus, on more bailouts, on bigger subsidies, uh, on uh, more potent domestic industrial policy, and also more trade protectionism with disruption to supply chains. Um, one other point, I think, is that the nation state is very much back. We saw that with the global financial crisis. I think we're going to see a, a ratcheting up of that. Global cooperation is going to be under more pressure. Uh, we've seen already, notably in the EU, the reliance predictably on national measures, but uh, little uh, pan-EU cooperation. Um, and who knows what the changes are going to be in terms of world order, the role of the United States, its leadership, the role of the European Union, the role of China. So to, to put it in a nutshell, I think we, we are definitely in a new mercantilist era. Um, and some of the lasting effects, I suspect, will be malign. Um, the really bad scenario is that we return to a kind of interwar 20th century situation, uh, uh, which was disastrous all around and which led to uh, a second world war. Uh, one should hope that it won't, it won't uh, go that far. But I think that the challenge for those who believe in markets and in a legitimate but not unlimited role for government uh, is to, and this is this very much follows from Sarat's concluding comments, uh, is, is to advocate sort of sensible policies in the short term uh, that rely as much as possible on market instruments and argue very much against some of the more damaging uh, policies uh, uh, in, the, in the medium to long term, because the political pressure to go down that route is going to be very significant. I'll leave it there, Anita. Thank you, uh, Professor Sali. Um, I think the, the next question that seems to be quite popular, we're getting it on Slido and on the group chat, is basically that um, now that we've had quite a long curfew period in uh, the country, uh, the, the most vulnerable uh, daily wage workers are going to be and have been hit quite badly. Um, there are quite a few aspects to this question. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll direct it both at uh, Dr. Dimel and uh, uh, Dr. Raj Patirana, but basically it's, it's, there are two points being raised. Uh, the first is uh, how long can we sustain this curfew? And um, the second is how do you, what can, what can be done to minimize the economic hit on these vulnerable populations? Uh, Dr. Dimel, would you like to start? To come in on that, that's a great question and perhaps the most important question we can ask at this time. Uh, my answer is going to be a little long, but very focused on the question. Okay. Um, I, I think that uh, Dr. Rajapatrana talked about, um, you know, managing uh, the uh, disease and to what extent is this the economic strategy. I want to argue that management of COVID-19 is fundamentally also an economic strategy and I'll tell you why. Uh, because it is very clear that management of COVID-99 or the restriction of the virus, the mitigation of the virus, uh, involves restricting human activity quite a lot. Of course, the more you restrict human activity, the more negative impact you have on the economy. So let me use two analogies uh, in thinking about that, because the casualties that we have are not just casualties from the virus. It's also casualties 
that come from the economic uh, lockdown. So let's, uh, the, my first analogy is imagine there is a serial killer or a bunch of serial killers running rampage through your country. Uh, and you discover that one of them is in a particular village. Uh, now, it's very hard to catch these guys. They seem to move fast and, uh, and keep uh, moving from one place to other, another. So you say, every time I know they're in a particular village, I'll bomb the whole village. You will get your serial killer, uh, but, you will but if the idea is to protect human beings and society, then you've got to start counting not, not only how many murders you prevent, the serial killer doing, but how many people you kill in the process of getting at that serial killer. So it's this classic, uh, in, in war, war terminology, it's the classic trade-off between getting the enemy combatant and the civilian casualties. So the civilian casualties here are the economic casualties that we may not be counting, mm. right? We are counting two COVID deaths or maybe three by today, uh, but how many people have died uh, due to difficulties in getting medicine, going to hospital, standing in queues and getting uh, heart attacks, right? And these things are happening. Uh, but it's going to get a lot worse as the lockdown continues. The second uh, analogy I have is of, uh, you know, cricket. We like cricket in Sri Lanka. You know, we have to decide whether you are in a test match or a 2020 match. In a 2020 match, you're willing to go after the runs, you don't mind losing wickets. In a test match, you understand that you must go after the runs, but you must also preserve your wicket, right? So uh, the lockdown, uh, you know, curfew, every, every week of curfew, you're losing a wicket because there is going to be lockdown fatigue. A society can't live in curfew for a long time. And you've got to know when you want to actually lose your wicket. So in a 50-50, in a 50 overs match, for instance, you decide to accelerate at a particular time because that's when you want to, you can, you're willing to risk wickets for runs. At the early stages, you're not willing to do that. So there is a management strategy. And that management strategy comes out of recognizing the relationship between your mitigation level and how the disease is going to progress. So the fundamental economic uh, or calculation uh, is epidemiological calculation really, is, you know, will our health system be able to cope uh, as the disease spreads and how do you keep this, the peak spread of the disease at a level that the health system can cope? Uh, actually, we've done the math on that um, and we have some numbers uh, and, you know, mitigation has various uh, levels. So you talk about mitigation in the, in the sense of how many people will an infected person infect? Uh, so if one infected person in, infects one or less, then that's a, almost a suppression strategy. Uh, and, and the disease does not increase in number. It stays ex exactly the same or reduces over time. I think we can't run a suppression strategy in Sri Lanka for two reasons. If you run a suppression strategy, you've got to run it till you have a vaccine. Uh, and you've got to run it with the kind of curfew or even further suppression uh, that the government is currently contemplating. And that may be unsustainable and we, the economic casualties may pile up quite fast in a way that can't be managed. Uh, and the duration in which you have to run it is too long. So then you ask, well, can we have a mitigation strategy that's less than suppression? Uh, that does that allows a certain level of economic activity to take place, but the spread rate is more than one. Okay, uh, when you do the math, uh, it seems that Sri Lanka might be able to cope with a spread rate of 1.5, in which case the peak case numbers will be in come in 253 days into the future. Uh, if you even if you if, even if you have a very very high spread rate like Italy saw in the early days of 3.5 the peak won't come 66 days into the future. This is a long match, right? Uh, so spread, the peak can come 143 days, 101 days into the future, depending on the spread rate. But if you manage, a, so if you manage a mitigation strategy that has a spread rate of two, let's say, mm. the peak will come in 143 days, uh, might still be manageable, okay? Uh, so I think Sri Lanka has to first make a strategic decision on whether it is really trying to achieve suppression uh, and in which case are we preferred to be in curfew for nine months uh, or, or more till a vaccine is out and deployable in the country, which may take a very yeah. long time. And if not, what is the, the mitigation strategy we are running and can we keep calibrating it 
to be able to cope with the healthcare system. Now, I have more to say on this, but I'd like uh, uh, Sarat to come in first, and then I'll talk about the fiscal strategies and other economic strategies available. Great. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Uh, Dr. Rajapathruna, if you could uh, unmute your mic. And uh, so, Nishan, as, as usual, posed two very important uh, <laughs> models, if you like, uh, on the assassination story. I, I, have, I have been away from cricket for a long time, so I won't touch it. <laughs> on the assassination study, I would train assassin to go and get this bad man. I won't bomb it uh, from the air. Uh, I will. Train person to get it, or one or two person. So it won't be a total wipeout, uh, uh, you know, because the uh, it'll be very expensive in terms of life. After all, that is why we are all trying to do. On the, uh, I think the numbers uh, that uh, uh, has given are quite uh, discouraging. Very really long term, 134 days, 240 days. And, I, if I am, I'm trying to take a bet that uh, because of the reason that uh, uh, Razin also said we are better today, uh, I think that people start working on a, a, a virus antidote. I think that it might come earlier than the, I think SARS virus went for, uh, we found the, uh, uh, a uh, proper uh, protocol to fight it in a short time. And it may be even shorter now, but although this virus, as Rasin also mentioned, is moving moving very fast. I am more, um, what is the word? Um, I, I, my worry is this. I, I agree with him that uh, sometimes it is, it, uh, sometimes quantitative restrictions are allowed even under WTA rules when you have emergency. But emergency, by definition, is a short-term thing. One, uh, otherwise you can't have continuing emergency. Number one, number two, is that uh, there are there are there are should be measures taken not to make it a habit, not not for it to uh, continue. Once you hit your target and you say you stay there, my difficulty is the political economy part. I think that if you give uh, policymakers a lot of leeway to play about with QRs, then you have to appoint the czar. You have to decide that once you move away from the price system, uh, after say emergence, shall we say, we need a czar to say who decides what are the essential goods and non essential. We had that movie before in 1970 to 77. Uh, we had that, you know, we had, a, I used to work with, uh, we used to uh, discuss with the IMF, uh, I was at the Central Bank then. So we had a very irrational situation. Uh, grand pianos worth $10,000 were allowed <laughs> imported, whereas a small fiat, uh, which was less than that, could not be. You know, there was not a irrational thing. Well, that is the problem. Yeah, I stopped here. Uh, to just sort of, uh bring it back to the questions I'm seeing on Slido and on the chat as well. Uh, the general uh, question people are having is, given our large informal sector, given the fact that even formal sector workers, especially in say the apparel industry are right now very vulnerable, what are the steps that can be taken um, to sort of soften this? Um, I'm happy to come in, come in on that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think um, Razin was perfectly right on the fiscal space. Uh, the government doesn't have a lot of ability to borrow uh, and doesn't have a lot of money to spend. Uh, actually, government can't legally spend. Uh, and even today, there's a question of the legality of government actions. Uh, and unless parliament is reconvened, we can't even put legality back into government mm -hmm. activity. Uh, but quite apart from that, does government may not have the ability. But uh, fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus now is not about interest rates uh, and borrowing rates only. They, there can be some targeted activity there. But it is asking the question how, you know, spending to mitigate the spread of the virus can also help the economy. And I'll give you some examples on how you can think about like that. 
So for instance, we can create jobs in building out new hospital infrastructure. We can create jobs in building uh, in healthcare and assisting doctors, assisting the healthcare system. Uh, these are these are things that are obviously good for the in terms of getting the income to people uh, and enabling them to live, uh, as well as preparing to contest the to reduce the virus. We can create jobs in quarantine services. Uh, Singapore requisitioned their top hotels to become quarantine centers, and you know people are less resistant resistant to quarantine if you're going to spend it in a five star hotel mm -hmm. and singapore uh, contracted on baseline rates that they will mm -hmm. pay their hotels uh, and told people hey come in quarantine so you know they have uh, um, singapore currently has um, i think about uh, 400 active cases they have had 900 on to in total uh, but they have 4000 people in quarantine uh, but the economy is actually helped by quarantine as well Okay, because uh, people are quarantining using services that are like the tourism sector that is otherwise underused. And notice that Singapore hasn't gone into the level of economic lockdown that Sri Lanka has, and it's considered mm -hmm. a success story. It's keeping its economy working, it's keeping it running, but has intelligent, good measures to control the rate of spread. And I think Sri Lanka should be trying to learn from Singapore uh, and doing that. Uh, we can create jobs in manufacturing masks. Our apparel sector, if it's having problems exporting, can be shifted to ma manufacturing masks. We tell people not to wear masks today because we want to keep enough masks for the healthcare workers. But Taiwan has reduced spread. Uh, you know, it's helped by being a mask-wearing society. We can, for a while, become a mask-wearing society, right? Because sometimes you may have the virus, you may not even know. So mask doesn't always protect you from catching the virus, but it certainly helps you spreading. But you may not know that you're a spreader uh, and having a mask can be a good thing. Uh, we, can, uh, we can create jobs in delivering food, uh, in, in manufacturing food and services. A lot of instability is being created in the current methodology, in the current curfew, because it's one day on, one day off. You know, small suppliers who we need to empower, not the big supermarkets only, uh, don't know how to plan because the government changes its mind on say curfew and lockdown every other day uh, on movement. But you have to create a stable policy. This is where parliament may be useful uh, and allow people in the, in the industries that are helping to manage the virus and the spread and the lock, you know, reduced activity actually flourish and succeed. So that's a way of achieving uh, both at the same time. And I think for people that we can't get into employment, we can get into education. We have an enormous uh, uh, you know, uh, vocational training uh, apparatus spread all over the country. Uh, this is a great time to tell people, come take courses. You know, government is throwing it up free. Here's, we'll provide some kind of technology to get you connected. Uh, you know, we'll, and, and find ways through television, through other means to enroll people in these courses and at least train them while they're staying at home, train them while they don't have a job. Uh, that's minimally setting up to reduce the shock that you're creating to the economy, maybe people will come up, come out better equipped when they can go back to work. That's better than staying at home, uh, being totally unproductive. So getting, you know, this is something, you know, Daniel Alphonsus, who was in the Ministry of Finance, uh, told me that was being discussed in France. Uh, and of course, every other country is, is doing, you know, put, deploying different technologies uh, in managing the mitigation better. Uh, so our technology and software companies can help us build drones that spot places where people are overcrowding and warn them. Uh, you don't have to have a policeman in every place. Australia is doing that. Australia also helps people quarantine by giving them a bracelet. Uh, you know, a little bit like when you put up somebody in house arrest, you give them a bracelet with a GPS. Uh, so you know if they are violating it or not. So I think in developing technologies to manage quarantine, in giving people jobs that help people uh, to support the healthcare system, as well as a, a, a less, a more quarantined uh, society, in converting. Uh, and, you know, I think we have to get out of the military providing quarantine services only to letting society provide these services, because that is good for jobs. Uh, that it, it achieves the quarantine activity as well as achieves the outcome in, in sp reducing the spread of the disease. So I think the, the strategy can be dual. Money can be spent that both helps people into jobs and income. So I think by economy, I really want to focus on jobs and income. 
if people have jobs and income and supply chains are working, uh, then you then and if those things are also helping mitigate the virus, that's a win-win. Uh, and Singapore may be Razin, uh, you maybe want to talk more about Singapore, it may be a great model for us to learn from uh, in this instance. Yes, yeah, yeah, let me Professor Sally. Shall I uh, okay thank thank you, Anita. Um, yeah, um, I'd like to make three points. Um, one concerns uh, mitigation versus uh, suppression and what, what we can learn from Singapore. Uh, but let, let, let me start with this, this point about quantitative restrictions on imports. Uh, I, mean, I, 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 I hope what Nishan is advocating is something time limited and restricted to a negative list. Um, rather than something more open-ended. Uh, I agree very much with Sarat's anxieties about how this might be yet another slippery path uh, down the road to even more permanent protection. Um, I think this has to be related to a macroeconomic point and, and indeed the vital one. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka will, will need balance of payment support. Um, hopefully it'll be forthcoming from the IMF under agreed conditions. Um, that should provide some cushioning against resort to quantitative restrictions. Uh, that's the ideal scenario in these, in these trouble circumstances. Uh, I say hopefully coming from the IMF rather than relying too much on other quarters. Uh, something I wondered about is whether China um, will take advantage of an opportunity like this to bail out Sri Lanka much more significantly than it has done. Uh, you know, without the usual uh, IFI conditionality, but of course, with longer term strings attached. Uh, and uh, as a strategic point, I think it's very important to avoid that. And that's one more reason to focus on the IMF. Uh, now, on the second point, mitigation versus suppression. Uh, yes, I think there are lots of good lessons to learn from Singapore and the other advanced East Asian countries. And by, by the others, I mean particularly South Korea, Taiwan, and even Hong Kong, not so much Japan. Um, but I think one should also be very, very sensitive to context. Um, I don't think there is uh, a silver bullet here and local context matters very much. Um, I, I think uh, uh, my essential takeaway from the points that Nishan made, arguing for a modified mitigation strategy for Sri Lanka is that uh, there's definitely going to be a, a, a trade-off. Uh, painful policy choices will have to be made as between suppression and mitigation. And those choices are not just a matter of strategic health policy, they're very much a matter of strategic economic policy as, as well. Uh, now, uh, one essential point about Singapore, um, Singapore, uh, like Taiwan and South Korea to a lesser extent, identified the problem early and addressed the problem early. I've had to take my temperature twice a day, morning and uh, afternoon, uh, and then file it online in the NUS system now for over two months. Uh, Restrictions kicked in uh, about two months after Chinese New Year, uh, and they've been gradually ratcheted up. Um, uh, I've been doing online teaching since Chinese New Year. Uh, now, that's unremarkable. It's the best of Singapore in a sense. But uh, I think that the key point is this. Singapore addressed the issue early. It has had mass testing. I think about 50,000 people tested so far, which is significant as a proportion of the total population. 
and of course, very sophisticated contact tracing. And the cumulative effect of all this is that it has allowed Singapore, uh, in spite of closing the borders, not to lock down, uh, but to have staggered restrictions to the point where after this chat, uh, uh, I'm gonna go for my swim in an outdoor pool um, and I'll, I'll go to a cafe. Uh, now, these initial conditions uh, do not apply in Sri Lanka. No mass testing, no sophisticated contact, contact tracing. Uh, so while I think a lot of good lessons can be learned from Singapore and Taiwan and elsewhere, uh, I don't think it's to the point of saying we can follow their kind of staggered strategy rather than having a full lockdown. Uh, if, 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 if we look at the West, uh, um, I think what's, uh, yeah, yeah, just to finish this point very quickly, Anita, um, uh, this dramatic move from mitigation to suppression is probably wise given that the modeling shows that uh, continuing with a mitigation strategy would have resulted in far too many deaths and overwhelmed health systems. It's politically unsustainable apart from anything else. Uh, so local context matters and one has to extract lessons from abroad uh, selectively. Thank you, Professor. Um, so I'm seeing yeah. a sort of uh, general concern and anxiety on on, on the uh, on the group chat and on the on slido be of people asking the question of okay so we ease curfew um in order to have some economic activity um but then do we have the testing capacity to sort of contain the spread of the disease and on the other side how do we uh manage the aspect of governance um and make sure that you don't have governments expanding control in in the short term for very good reasons but with uh, worrying long-term impacts uh, anyone so would like to tackle on, that let me come in on that and to Razin's point right um, I yeah. think uh, it's a point well taken Sri Lanka does not have a bureaucracy or the sophistication of Singapore uh, and that does uh, reduce our ability to use subtle methods uh, and so blunt methods are what we first deploy. Uh, I think it's important uh, at the same time to count the cost of the blunt methods and ask what is the long-term strategy. So if you are going at it like a 2020 right now, what happens when your wickets have fallen? Uh, and that is the question I'm asking, right? So if, the, if there is no vaccination for another nine months, that's what the global prediction is right now, then, uh, can we sustain this level of economic activity and what is the economic casualties that you that you create in this level of lockdown? Uh, so all I'm saying is if we don't count the economic casualties and we're only counting casualties on COVID-19, we have a problem. This is why we are saying a sustainable spread is critical to manage uh, and you've got to do the math. Uh, at a 1.5 rate of expansion, we have an, on a draft estimation, we are working on this some more, uh, then it looks sustainable uh, for Sri Lanka and we may be hitting our peak just when a vaccine uh, is emerging. Uh, you get about 1.4 million cases, but infection rate is not as same as case detection rate. So the hospitals, and if you've taken that time also to build hospital capacity, we may be coping because, you know, 80% or maybe even 90% because, you know, 80% of cases that are detected don't go to hospital. Uh, and cases that are detected may be as low as one tenth of the people that are infected uh, in reality. Uh, so actually a very large percentage of those that are infected don't need hospitalization. Uh, so if, if the infection rate goes only up to 1.4 million, Sri Lanka can probably handle that. Uh, the alternative is that, you know, the, if you can't manage the lockdown for say more than two months, you're back at square one when you let go of the lockdown. The rate mitigate, you know, and if you haven't worked on alternate mitigation strategies, then you're going to get at a high speed, you know, or high rate of uh, uh, infection. Uh, and, you, and you're fighting that battle again, having expended a great deal of 
political and societal capital in running a lockdown too early, which is why I think you see some countries actually sequencing or timing their lockdown. They understand that mitigation strategies, in some instances, even mitigation strategies may not get you the whole distance. Uh, at 1.5, and there may have to be targeted lockdowns uh, to at, at certain points to reduce the spread rate below one. So maybe you say, look, in 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 June, I'm going to have two weeks of lockdown. In August, I'll have two weeks of lockdown, but you plan ahead. So you have staggered lockdowns uh, that you know that people prepare for so that they, they're not you know, in an impossible situation. Currently, what we are doing is we are making decision making day by day. We are telling you tomorrow that curfew will be lifted in five days. We are telling you in two days that it will be there for another two weeks. Uh, they, so different, and people, and so when curfew is lifted, you can expect mayhem because people don't trust government to, people don't trust their stability in thinking, decision making. There is no long term plan. Uh, but if you had a long term plan, you could also get society actually less anxious, less panicked. Panic is not good for your immune system. It makes you more vulnerable to the virus. So we really need to bring down the level of panic, uh, bring down the level of anxiety. That is good for management of the virus spread as well. Uh, create a more longer term plan that says this is our mitigation strategy. Uh, we'll have levels of mitigation. We can have even suppression strategies that are basically spread out. Uh, because at certain times, as the hospital capacity is, you know, looking like it's difficult, we can have targeted two-week lockdowns, uh, but everybody gets to plan with it, uh, function reasonably. So we might not be able to achieve what Singapore achieves, exactly. Yeah. But what we learned from Singapore is that a longer-term, thought-out, strategic approach that understands uh, that, you know, short-term success isn't long-term success is very important. Thank you, Dr. Dinner. Uh, before I move to my next question, just a quick reminder to everyone who's in on the Zoom chat to please switch off your microphones and your camera unless you are a panelist. Thank you. Um, Dr. Raj Patirana, um, if I could uh, direct this question at you. Um, people are basically asking the question of where is the money going to come from? Um, and in terms of uh, how are we going to meet our debt repayments? And also, is there a space like where should we be? Uh, where should we be seeing sort of internationally funded development programs? If they are going to be coming in, where should they be directing their money? Uh, Dr. Raj Patel? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, we have a very good record for debt in the sense that we have never defaulted. The reason why we didn't default, the other uh, quite somewhat different, but the point is we have good record, okay? So when recently about, uh, uh, about a year ago, when people were talking about debt trap, I challenged them, tell me about debt trap, what do you mean by it? So, uh, there, are, so there are different means to, one, one source, as Rasin mentioned, is the Chinese would come in, the IMF would come in, IMF had partitioned some funds already. Why, why I like the IMF coming in is that more than the money, it will impose some discipline on our spending. If we, but before that, I would say that we have to start with having a budget. This government has no budget. They should get together, get to parliament and have a budget first so that it becomes legal as Nishan said. But, but more than that, we agree, there is an agreement on how much we are going to spend where, okay? That, so that, that is first point. Second point is that I also completely agree with Nishant about uh, have a predictable uh, closer, uh, cl closing down that people can plan for. Now, I give a little example that I go to a pharmacy here, the name remains unnamed, they are very good. Now, the, that day that I was on the queue, usually that pharmacy would, my sort of a back of the envelope number would be, see about um, five, pe five people come to get their prescription filled and other so over the counter things in an hour. That day when I was in the queue and pushed into the thing, <laughs> there were about 30 people in the little place. There were hardly any. So we are actually doing something we are saying we are preventing. So if you say, if you do this way, checkered way, sometimes we open, sometimes we close. Now, I have to say this morning, when I listened to 
the new there were two important points first is that the old group like me we can now uh, uh, use our id card and go to a pharmacy which we couldn't do yesterday right and second is that uh, you can go to atm so even if we this, uh, even if the vans come uh, distributing vegetables fish and all people don't have the money actually <laughs> and people don't have the money to buy it so it's good to uh, plan it good to do it in a in a uh, uh, very well defined way i also like the uh, idea of uh, using the uh, price system you can ask the hotels to bid for some amount that they are putting guest and uh, because the uh, it is a all or nothing situation because if they don't do it they they their workers won't be they won't have any revenue so uh, so my agreement is with uh, after this initial phase we can have rolling uh, uh, openings uh, but announce in time we can say every day for example you can say every wednesday every two weeks wednesday we'll open for two hours and it may be even have some uh, area specific uh, we are doing it depending on how, how what you see and also that i am um, what still worried about what will happen the day after assume that we uh, that that i am still worried about that because if you are talking about economic growth very important things are now at risk about allocation in the short term after we finish this emergency uh, what will happen to our productivity growth which is been 1.4 they were half of what is the rest of the, uh, the developing world so i am worried about that so i think we will be you know in our hearts of heart we will we will survive this question is how do we have better standard of living in the future if we don't do our numbers and our work now in, uh, during this time to uh, move into the long medium and long term thank you uh, dr rajpat yes dr i mean on a short thing you can hear me yeah um I, i i i heard the comment about old people being able to mm. go to pharmacies we heard about pensioners i would um, i would ask us to think additionally that old people are the most vulnerable in terms of mortality uh, really if you listen to some countries their strategy is simply to protect old people because you know anita if you get the virus you're probably going to be fine i might be borderline uh, <laughs> but uh, dr rajapatra and i do not want you to go to a pharmacy okay because really protecting old people from contact with anyone uh is is fundamentally it should be part of our strategy uh and i think we really have to think about the you know having intelligent policies that target the problem properly we can't open for short spans of time as raj patel says uh, that is harmful uh we have to plan long openings long durations even 24 hour openings uh, and plan them in advance uh but i think the other category that we really have to pay attention to is what is the structure that we are setting in place for all the people uh especially to be protected the high mortality rates all emerge italy has a 23% of its population above 65 years of age that's why you're seeing such enormous uh you know death counts in italy europe has a similar problem with the aging population so sri lanka does need to to actually calibrate the strategy right uh, to ask what is what are we trying to achieve uh and that probably needs a lot more people uh discussing the issues and problems at the table uh which is why i think we're all saying if parliament or some some, some semblance <laughs> of parliament that enables different social uh and different you know concern, community groups to actually mm-hmm. express concern doesn't convene the government may function with too little information to make good policy mao sedong's very famous uh failure uh in the great leap forward happened simply because they didn't get good information uh because they were not listening uh they didn't hear what's going on in the country uh and there is a similar danger if you don't listen and i want to end by saying i agree with razin razin exactly i was precisely advocating a negative list not a positive list you can't sit down and decide what 
what can be imported, but you might be able to selectively say, okay, no grand pianos and uh, you know, uh, no BMWs, right? Uh, so, so negative list is precisely where it should be targeted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pina. Um, so we're coming towards what will be the close of the this session, um, but just to what may possibly be the last question. There is, to bring it back to economics and post COVID, um, how are we going to, how is Sri Lanka going to manage, how our global economy is going to manage? Uh, Professor Sali, if you could weigh in on this to kind of tell us from a trade perspective, how it would affect Asia and Sri Lanka, especially given that there seems to be this shift, like you said, towards uh, the back, back to a nation state concept uh, where people are sort of pushing away from globalization and, and, and integration, at least in, in thought right now? Well, um, I mean, I mean to, to, to start with the present, uh, very much part of this um, global slump is a collapse in a combination of trade and travel. Uh, tourism, of course, uh, being subsumed under un, under travel, uh, so we're probably going to see a bigger drop in international trade volumes than we saw in 2008 2009. It was about 10 percent then. Um, uh, so it's probably going to be uh, quite a bit worse, um, uh, and it will, of course, hit export-oriented economies in East Asia particularly, particularly badly. Uh, even when the recovery comes, uh, it's going to take time. There will be a lag uh, to get supply chains in good working order uh, again. Uh, so th that's, I think, the, the present and what will happen tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Um, now, what, what the historical record also tells us is that we will have a better recovery if trade is put back together as quickly as possible. Uh, and this is, of course, not just a question of logistics and time. It's a question of policy. Uh, so if we see protectionist measures that were put in place increasingly before the crisis and those that are being put in pla place during the crisis, uh, uh, getting worse, becoming entrenched, uh, not being rolled back, then of course we'll have, we'll have a slower recovery uh, around, around the world. So it is imperative uh, that the trade engine uh, starts again uh, at, at some stage, and that's a matter of policy. But I think that that's, that's part of a bigger picture that gets back to one of uh, Sarat's um, initial points, looking beyond the short-term health and economic effects and uh, policy responses. Uh, we need to think about the medium term, I think in two important respects. One is a sustainable macroeconomic strategy uh, into the medium term. And in Sri Lanka's case, that really does revolve around uh, sustainable debt management. That's not new. Uh, and secondly, uh, making sure that the economy uh, has the enabling conditions for a productive recovery. Um, and, and that means uh, not resorting to further long-term protectionism um, uh, to open up the economy further if possible. Uh, and to remove bottlenecks to enterprise in the domestic economy. Um, the political pressure uh, will probably be in the opposite direction. So that, that has to be pushed. For a time. Um, I would like to ask you to switch your mic off so that we could go back to Professor Sali, please. Uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, apologies for the interruptions. Um, I think I uh, would like to start wrapping up now. Dr. Rajpathirana, if you would have any yeah. final remarks to make. Yeah, I have, I have. I agree with uh, Razin's point. Uh, I, I have seen countries in my last incarnation in terrible uh, debt situations. 
Actually, I know one country where the debt to GDP ratio was 800 <laughs> uh, percent. Guyana in South America, and everybody thought it was a lost case, but uh, Sri Lankan helped, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, they were able to uh, sell their instruments to create a bond, that, like Argentina did. On the one hand, second thing is the IMF helps out. Uh, and so other, other thing that, what, what I'm saying is that debt itself of uh, postponing uh, debt repayment with respect to maturity, converting into bonds and selling it to the markets and there's so many options are available. But in order to conclude, I say we have to exactly have a good macroeconomic system in place going forward. And we should be thinking about it while other one group of people are dealing with the short term and how to get rid of this uh, uh, medical situation, somebody should think about the economic situation to going forward. <laughs> that closes my uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Raj uh, Dr. Dimmel, would you uh, like to make a closing remark? Uh, Dr. Dimmel, you're muted. So fundamentally, I think it's important to understand that there are casualties not only from the COVID virus, but also from COVID control. Um, and unfortunately, there's an inverse relationship between the two. Uh, unless you get to the extreme where the disease spreads totally beyond control and, and drowns your health system. So that means that when you try to reduce casualties from the COVID virus, you end up increasing casualties from COVID control. Okay, that's one. Second is that, you know, from an economic and uh, casualty reduction perspective, that the mitigation strategy may need to be measured uh, because you don't want to expend all your wickets scoring a few runs in the first two months uh, and have no ability to run that mitigation uh, afterwards. So we need to decide that the mitigation strategy may need to be measured. We need a nine month plan, uh, not a two week plan or a two month plan. Uh, a nine month plan, and that is very important. Thirdly, that the fiscal response and the stimulus response that targets COVID reduction uh, can be converted into measures that also increase economic opportunity at the same time, that give people jobs and give people incomes. When you think like that, you have a win-win uh, proposition for fiscal engagement. That's not just putting subs welfare money in people's pockets, giving them jobs they can do, that pay them and help also at the same time by doing that job to reduce the spread or manage better the disease uh, people from COVID virus. So let me end with those three ideas. Thank you, Dr. Dimmel. Professor Sali, would you like to uh, make a closing remark? Uh, I think I did before. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> All right, um, thank you. I'd like to, I think we'll, we can wrap up now, uh, right on time. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists today for uh, taking time and sitting at home, getting all of this infrastructure ready and uh, coming in um, to discuss this with us. I think it was a really fruitful and definitely interesting um, uh, session. Uh, we've had some uh, very different perspectives, uh, uh, interesting analogies of cricket brought in. I feel like that one is going to be reused quite a bit. Um, and uh, yes, so I, if anyone joined the session in halfway, we have live streamed it on Facebook and you would be able to find the link both in the chat and on our page and you'll be able to catch the first half of the session. Um, thank you everyone for joining in. Um, wash your hands, stay safe. Hopefully we'll be able to um, meet again soon. Bye. Thank you, Anita. Yeah, bye. Thanks very much. Yeah, bye. Bye.